On Sunday, December 14, 2014, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, hosted Dying to Know at the Rio Theater in Santa Cruz, California. The film is a documentary narrated by Robert Redford and produced by Gay Dillingham about the relationship between psychedelic explorers Timothy Leary and Ram Dass as Leary approaches his death in 1995. The film moved one viewer to remark, this film makes me want to live more and love more. This view spoke for many of us in the audience. Today, history is coming full circle as scientific research into psychedelics grows. MAPS, at the leading edge of this research, completed a study last year of LSD-assisted psychotherapy to treat end-of-life anxiety, and is now beginning a new study on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for anxiety related to life-threatening illness. Psychedelics may change the way we experience death. After the film, there was a discussion featuring producer and director Gay Dillingham, MAPS executive director and founder Rick Doblin, and MAPS-sponsored researcher Dr. Phil Wolfson. I'm just going to ask Gay a few questions. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the movie, and then we'll move on to um, a couple of other speakers. And then we'll have a longer question and answer period after that. So um, my f first, yeah, maybe we can have a little bit of house light. Just so, because it looks like a dark yeah. space when I know there's yeah. a lot of a lot of light out there. Um, the thing that one of the questions that when after watch, I mean, this is just so many layers in that film, and and it's just fabulous to watch. So thank you very much. I had a question of what drew you to this. I mean, this. Why did you do the film? The layers, right? <laughs> It's like baklava, I could answer that in a lot of different levels. And these two guys and the story and the period and all of it is, is so rich and so multi-layered. Um, so I rode the wave after the 60s, born in 65. Uh, I think the first time I heard Leary's name mentioned was when my brother was getting in trouble because he had driven two hours to Oklahoma City to see Timothy Leary. Who's this Timothy Leary dude on a school night and he's getting in trouble? So then fast forward, I'm in college. I saw him in um, his tour when he was promoting LSD, Larry Software Design. But at that stage, <laughs> at that stage, he was, he, was, he was the showman. He was doing his thing. So I wasn't really taken yet. It was meeting him on his deathbed through the, the eyes of Ramdas and his love that really turned me on to this beautiful man. And it's the relationship between the two of them. People, some people call this the Leary film, some people call this the Ramdas film, and, and I just um, really fell in love with their relationship and how they saw each other. And um, the themes in this have really been my lifelong journey and uh, between death bringing my, me to my knees early at 17, I lost my brother when he was 20. And also psychedelics is a beautiful medicine to guide and dream my dream life. So those are the th three things that kind of helped me navigate. And so, so much came together in this story and these people in this film. And, and of course, I started it in 1995. Um, <laughs> so in some ways, we've kind of caught up with the zeitgeist. People are more interested in this now. I mean, I've been interested in it for a long, you know, as long so as I can So you were just walking down the street, and you came across oh. some films in a box. Okay, or actually, how did, the, question. Yeah, okay, how like did the, the actual okay. thing happen? You Timothy had announced he was dying in the media, 1995, December. And I was having dinner um, with a few people, and we said, what can we do? This is a historical moment. And um, my husband, Andrew, came up with the idea, let's bring Ram Dass down to put in a, him in a dialogue with Tim. So that was a brilliant. So that, yeah. that, that was your and your husband's sort of, you were inspired to bring them together. It was his idea, and then I was going to direct this thing. So my entry point was their unique perspective on death and psychedelics and ego death as practicing ego, you know, psychedelics helping practice ego death. 
So, um, you know, I came up with questions, gave them to Ram Dass. Of course, that was a little risky as a director because these guys are brilliant anarchists. <laughs> there was a lot of interruption going on. So the cutting became a little difficult. But it was worth it because it was set and setting. It was like, let's create the right environment for these guys to really meet each other. And, and it was the last time they, they really, particularly on, on camera, certainly. And um, so, uh, most of my filming was 95, 96, and then Ram Dass had his stroke, February of 97. A lot of things happened in my life. I left filmmaking, deaths in my family, so I put this down for a lot of years. But there was something really beautiful that kept haunting me in this, in this story and these people, and I kept working, working the material, really, marinating it, digesting it. Um, and then I went back to Ram Dass a couple few times throughout the years. He became a very good friend and teacher and helped me through some tough spots. And, um, but it's interesting because I didn't set out because I wanted to glorify or demonize or, you know, I just had the good fortune to, you know, be set up this conversation between these two iconic figures that really shifted our consciousness. And um, so over time, I. Uh, you know, like I say, I went back and started editing and working these ancillary interviews, what, 2012, 13, started editing. And um, so this is fresh. This is only like my sixth or seventh screening. And so it's really nice to be here. <laughs> so. <laughs> top shelf audience you are, top shelf. <laughs> I know that one of the reasons that you wanted to show it here in Santa Cruz and from MAPS audience is that you wanted feedback and you wanted people to, to sort of let you know how they, what they feel and think about the film. Right. So what is the best way that people can actually communicate what they thought to you? And then, do you have a website dying to know? Well, we do have a website. I'm going to get this all much better worked out. But in the meantime, the website is a good way. And also, personally, I'm here. But dyingtoknowmovie.com is the website. There's a way to, you know, please at least let me know how to reach you and what your stories and thoughts are. And so I'm working out all that distribution, you know, piece of it now. And um, so it's really encouraging to know that audiences are get you know feel so something. So you're nice. you're looking for distribution, national distribution. Of, right well, now, finding or? the right partners. I'm going to distribute it one way or the other, and it's like who, what partners am I going to use to get it out? So there you go. If you're out there and um, you're interested <laughs> in a partnership, <laughs> what would that involve? What would well, that and like, like I said, I created. The, I mean, I, I did this film because I wanted to start conversations. So you know, having the intimate, you know settings where people get to watch it and talk about what comes up. I mean, some of the compliments, I've gotten compliments from young kids that have no clue who these guys are, you know, who say, this film makes me want to live more and love more. And that was good to hear. And other people say, you know, my mother's dying or somebody's dying or I'm dying. I, I have to watch this or I have to show this to somebody. That's, that's such a tender, important moment. But that's, you know, um, if this can help in that moment of that transition, it's a real um, blessing for me. I mean, after 19 years, you really obsess with something, obviously, in that period of time. You think, God, I hope somebody else gets what I'm doing. Otherwise, it's been a lot of time. Uh, so, yeah, I think glad it, it means something to others. I think it definitely does. I mean, you could tell. Um, I, we have a, we want to get into a question and answer with Gay in the audience, but first we're going to have a couple of short talks. One um, is by the, uh, Phil Wolfson, Dr. Phil Wolfson, who is uh, right now about to begin a study with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for people um, with life-threatening illnesses. And so it's very much related to the kind of work you're doing. And then we will have Rick Doblin come up and talk a little bit. And then we'll open it up to question and answer from the audience. Um, and a conversation among the three of them. So um, thank you. Thank yeah. you thank for you. doing this. Um, Phil, do you want to have Gay stay for a minute? Or do you want to just talk about the study? We should stay together. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get a front row seat at the talk. Okay. Being together, isn't it? <laughs> And uh, so the film is uh, beyond comprehension, wonderful. And uh, for me at 71, most of the people in the film were my friends or colleagues. 
So Sultra Malioni was my first Vajrayana, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. And I started with her in the uh, middle 90s. And the week before Ramdas stroked, he and I, I took him out to lunch in San Anselmo. And we had this exuberant lunch. And we were planning to solve and integrate Eastern and Western psychology. We were as manic as you could be. And we sat there for like an hour and a half and then two hours and everything was going by. It was like uh, my mind was blown. It was just an amazing thing. And he was so turned on. And then a week later, he had the stroke. And then being with him at times as he attempted to speak for all of us. Initially, he had a mission, which was to be there in the world of impaired mind and see a way that he could be for all of us who might suffer that way and to take us through to another level of healing. And, and he really pursued that. He did it. And in so many ways, he's been a, a guide around both life and death, and the movie is so poignant around this dialogue between two types of people who represent in some ways cognitive and in other ways spirit heart. And it's kind of a, a, a plane for all of us to drop into, to see ourselves in a sense of where we fit on that spectrum, on that continuum, you know, and how to integrate it because as a couple, they integrate both aspects. They're, they're speaking to both aspects. And the issue of drugs, when I watch your movie, it's not about drugs. It's about medicines. It's about opportunities for consciousness. It's about how we integrate mind manifesting experiences within a total life framework. Because that's what we're really about. I mean, it's not simply recreational. We can get there a bit on recreation, but it's about how we live. So uh, on the personal level, um, I met Sasha Shogun, who's not in the movie because he belongs there in some ways, who's the father, really, of modern MDMA. MDMA was synthesized in 1912. But Sasha brought it back in the late 70s, and he tested drugs that he made. He worked them up, and he worked up MDMA, and he found it to be extraordinarily beneficial for heart. And what he found, and what we have found, is that it amplifies our ability to be with positive emotions and amplifies our ability to handle negative emotions. And later we came to call it an empathogen, something that generates our ability to be with ourselves and others. So 1983, Sasha first tripped me. I was a psychiatrist working in an alternative mental health facility in Contra Costa County where we did process work. People uh, were respected for their breaks and we tried to help them without mind mugging them and see them through. It was very, very difficult work, but in many cases we helped people and we used families and we used the wider community, which is, so we're looking at mind and spirit and community, uh, you know, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha in a lot of ways as we look at Buddhism. And so I was looking to help a young guy who had been mugged by the psychiatric profession and driven into abyss of non-being. And how do you unlock someone? And Sasha sat with me and said, well, first you got to understand this before you try it with anyone else. I'd been psychedelic since 1964, but I had never used MDMA. It was novel in my life, and in, it was very early. And after that, I started doing uh, in this legal period, which ended in 1985, uh, psychedelic, well, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And I did it with numerous couples, with individuals, with families. I published on working with families. At first, I and other practitioners who were doing the work, we'd get stoned with people, but that was a bummer. How often can you get stoned if you're working with people? You have day afters, it's too much. And then we really perfected sitting with people. And uh, 
And it was a revolution in therapy. Why was it a revolution? Because we were having to be with people for not 50 minutes or now 45 minutes for 250, 300 bucks, but for three hours or four hours or as long as it took to handle people in their altered states and in their emotional states that came out of their experience. And ecstasy, as it's now called, in those days we called it Adam. Ecstasy is not a simple experience, it can be tough. You can have a bad trip. You can get into really dark places which you need to go to. So ecstasy is a misnomer. A lot of people say, oh, I did ecstasy, but it was hell. But that's usually not the case because the contact and the integration that comes from the work of putting things together when you're really doing therapy, you're sitting with people helping them to put things together, to come back to some sense of this was beneficial, I learned this, though it was difficult. Boy, I want to explore that. And that's true for all psychedelics. So. Uh, it, it was wonderful work, and it really revolutionized how we did things, which is part of the spirit of this movie, because you couldn't just walk away. And a lot of us who love being therapists just expanded as such. And then I had a personal tragedy. My uh, oldest son was 12 and 3 quarters, and suddenly he had leukemia. My mother had just died. My brother-in-law got a brain tumor. He subsequently died. And Noah, I wrote a book about our life and his life as a, a young man struggling for life. Uh, he lived four more years with the help of modern medicine, which I'm grateful for because he would have been dead in two or three weeks. Um, MDMA was a facilitator for our integration as a family because illness divides people. It doesn't only unify people. And it's a stress. It's a terrible stress. And in families, it puts pressure on everyone. Siblings, you lost a brother. Siblings are neglected at times in prolonged illness because the sibling is put aside, not deliberately, but the attention falls on the other person. Uh, and so having integrative sessions, which I wrote about in the book explicitly, around ecstasy. I could sit with the kids and my wife and we could play. The kids would know we were out there and they would tease us and they'd say, eh, you can't do anything, you can't cook a meal, you can't do pizza, you just all lay down on the couch. What's the matter with you? And we would take all kinds of Jewish shit. So it was, uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful integrative experience. And uh, we did it many times and it held us until my son's death uh, at near 17. And he never did it. He had the opportunity, but he never chose to do it. So it brings us around to this study that we're doing, which uh, Rick Doblin and my connection with him since the early 80s in that time has been so rewarding. And now we're doing a study with life-threatening illness and 18 subjects, mostly at uh, our home uh, with my partner, Julaine, and others, Cody and Lene, and the whole MAPS uh, group has been so powerful and adept in making the study go through. We've gotten the FDA approval uh, and we're waiting on DEA approval, but hopefully in January we'll begin. And what's really the goal of the study? Well, it's multiple. One, we're going to have an experience with people who are really anxious about death and about relapse, and there's good reason. Not everybody gets quite so peaceful. My son only made peace. You can imagine a child who's struggling to be alive with all his energy, his furious, ferocious energy to stay alive. That, you know, only changed when he knew he had six days to live and we took him home from Seattle and bone marrow transplant. And then he finally said, I gotta relax. You know, I gotta let go. And grief does go on. It doesn't stop. And it's just how you follow what Ramdas said, the dancing ball of your life. It comes up, it comes down. And it is about love. And it isn't about an endless pit. It's about that love continues. So in our study, one goal, I think, is to help people find that love. 
And we can conceptualize it as making peace with their death, with impermanence in the Buddhist sense, but it's about helping people to not go with guilt, not go with so much fear, to recognize that impermanence and the end of our lives is inevitable and that, you know, it's enriching, it's powerful and enriching to know that this life is limited, to not be hysterical and clutching all the time about how much more do I have? So many people die instantly, young, don't have a chance, war consumes so many people that, you know, it's tragic. I spent four years and many tens of thousands of dollars, maybe half a million dollars, who knows what the medical system cost us to keep my son alive and then snuff some boy dies in Oakland at 18, the same age or more or less. And so we have a really screwed up attitude towards life and sustaining life. We put all this into keeping people alive forever. Hospice is great, but we're still spending so much time on keeping alive people who don't have much mind left. My own father had no mind for 10 years and he wouldn't go. He had enough mind to say, I won't quit. I don't want to go. Fuck you, I'm not going. You know? And, uh, you know, and so he stayed kind of like a, a vegetable. I'm a vegetarian, but he was a rutabaga, you know? <laughs> and uh, it was difficult, because he had a great mind, he was a great spirit, a great person for much of his life. And then he spent 10 years really not having a life. So these are very complex issues. So that's one. Two, uh, you're a great audience. I want to say you rock. We all rock here. We should say, we rock Santa Cruz. Come on, we rock. We rock. Yeah, we really rock. And, and what we rock about, we rock about being for this exploration. And we rock about psychedelics for psychotherapy, for mind manifestation. And we rock about community. And we rock about legalization. Because in the end, that's what we're trying for. We're trying to get back to a place where we can use substances, in this case we're demonstrating the scientific value, but where we can use substances for the benefit of our mind growth, our spirit growth, our community growth, our hearts. And that's really the objective. Okay, last thing while Rick comes up for audience participation. So the slogan is right, turn on, tune on, turn on, tune in, but drop in, what would you like? We thought be love. Turn on, tune in, tune in, be love. I want to hear any audience ideas. What would you put for the number three spot? What do you got? Anybody? Rock on. Rock on from <laughs> Barlow. What else we got? Anyone? What? B1. B1? One. One? Say it again. B1. B1. One. One. Okay, how about B many though? <laughs> Any other Same ideas? Thing. Okay, thank you very much. So my mashup for the whole thing. <laughs> my mashup for the whole thing is be here now and think for yourself with unconditional love. <laughs> Are you a <laughs> you watched an early cut. I did. Um, well, should we stay here? Yeah, yeah, stay, stay. So, again, I'd like to just thank you for coming all the way out here to share your movie with us and also for having given me the pleasure of watching an earlier version of it and then talking about it frame by frame about different ideas that it resonated in me. And it's, it's come he a long way. You did watch it frame by frame, friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things that I'm left with um, is the thought about um, Nixon saying that Timothy Leary was the most dangerous man in America. He also said that about Ellsberg. I mean, I can't think of <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, both friends of mine. <laughs> Yeah, and both interested um, in these areas, too. Um, and also about the pain that Tim had to go through to be in solitary confinement for a total of two and a half years. And it just makes me scared, in a way, to think about 
how those of us that are interested in psychedelics, that, that could possibly be our fate. It's not um, likely, and the tide is turning in the other direction, but that many people are in cages right now for that, uh, some in solitary and some in not. And there's a, a question of why is that, and what is really driving this, and how do we undo it? And for me, I was able to, um, I was born in 53, I grew up in the era where I really believed the education I was getting that psychedelics made you permanently crazy. And it was only through reading One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey and having a friend tell me that part of it was written under the influence of LSD that made me question maybe LSD didn't really make you crazy. And by the time I was engaged in um, trying to figure out what to do about Vietnam and, and looking at what the Beatles were doing with Tim and others about the protests for the war, it, it became clear to me that I had really been misled. And so in 71 and 72, when I first took LSD and it opened me up to my feelings, um, I felt like um, this, this resonance from Nixon about um, Tim being the most dangerous man in, the, in America, that that actually pointed to um, something that, that I think was going on in that this unit of experience of psychedelics that helps us to feel connected, it helps us to realize that there's something deeper than our nationality or our religion or our gender or our sexual orientation or our economic status or, or anything that, that we have this um, common bond with, with all of life and with the whole universe and that that is dangerous to certain control systems that try to divide and conquer. And that that's, I think, what Nixon was talking about. There's a certain compassion and openness that comes from the psychedelic experience gone right that makes people uh, both question authority, as Tim would say, and also focus more on love, as Ramdas was talking about. And that that felt to me like something that we all needed as a, individuals and as humanity. And that this um, sort of criminalization with the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 and then the wiping out of psychedelic research all over the world, that, that this was uh, something that I would devote myself to bringing back. Yeah. And I, th <laughs> I, I, I think there's a, a way in which the world that we are in now, it needs to die in a certain way. We need to become more spiritual. We need to become more unitive, and it's the death and rebirth process. And the studies with psychedelics, with uh, end-of-life related anxiety, are a doorway into our culture. And so we were able, as part of this psychedelic renaissance, to bring back psychedelic research to Harvard. After all of those years, um, we were able to bring back MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for cancer patients with anxiety. So it took um, the focus on helping people deal with death to overcome the resistance at Harvard that had um, been there for over 40 years after Tim and Ramdas left in 63. And the quintessential symbol of the 60s, the LSD, there was um, that we, we'd started research with MDMA, there was research with psilocybin, but LSD had not yet been brought back into uh, research. And the way we were able to do that was with LSD for people who had life-threatening illnesses that were um, anxious about it in Switzerland. And one of the things that I'm most proud of that MAPS accomplished um, since 1986 when I started it was that we were able in 2000, and, uh, late in 2007, um, to start LSD research when Albert Hoffman and his wife Anita were still alive. So that Albert, who had really had this uh, bicycle experience in 1943 and talked about LSD, my problem child, and having it turn into the wonder child, that for Albert to be able to see with his own eyes that there was a return coming 
even though it was just a few months before he died, that that gave me incredible satisfaction and, and him too. And I, I think that this whole um, process, uh, the, the area that we're making the most progress in right now is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. And in a way, the reason that we're making the most progress gets us back again to death. It's with veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder from the wars. It's, it's also with women survivors of childhood sexual abuse and adult rape and assault. But I think from a cultural, psychological perspective, you know, in a way, sadly, what's really resonating with the most people, with the population, with the politicians, is the work with veterans. And through Richard Rockefeller, who died in a plane crash around six months ago, the last few years of his life, um, were devoted to trying to help us build a bridge with the military and to try to get the um, Department of Defense and the VA to work with us on MDMA for, for veterans. And so now we have tremendous evidence of how it can be helpful. Uh, the veterans communities around the country are real, and around the world are really sharing this information. There's over 22 vets a day commit suicide. And so the, the sense of time and urgency to move forward is, is really profound. Um, and to give you a sense of how things are shifting, um, on Wednesday, we're going to hear almost certainly about a grant um, that we're going to receive from the state of Colorado. And it's a $2 million grant for marijuana for post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans. Um, as you know, Colorado's legalized marijuana and also medical marijuana. And they have a $10 million fund for research. And so in the, um, in the years that um, MAPS has been around, 28 years, we've never had a government grant. <laughs> so for our first one to be a $2 million grant <laughs> is really pretty amazing. Um, and, I want to just re read to you a letter um, from the FDA uh, <laughs> from 1988, and um, just to give you a, um, a sense of the progress we made, and, and then we'll really open it up to um, questions. Um, now, in the um, 1984 is when the DEA first moved to criminalize MDMA. They had no knowledge that it was used as an underground, uh, quiet therapeutic tool. And they were very surprised when I went to Washington and filed for an administrative law judge hearing. Um, and then for a few years, we tried multiple different projects to get approval through the FDA. Because even though we won the lawsuit and the DEA administrative law judge said MDMA should be available as a medicine, the DEA rejected that. And um, it was clear then that the only way was through the FDA to bring it back. So this was, um, we thought that um, working with somebody who was dying, who had been um, previously assisted in a way by um, MDMA, uh, would be helpful. Um, and that, that was a patient of George Greer's, that was rejected. And then worked a bit with Rick Strassman to try to do, who later opened up the door with DMT research. And so this was an effort to try to do a protocol, MDMA for uh, people who were anxious about dying, and the, uh, there was a lot of concern about MDMA neurotoxicity. And so the uh, FDA, Dr. Paul Lieber wrote, um, we've considered your arguments about how uh, MDMA would be safe enough and do not find them persuasive. <laughs> uh, specifically, your argument that the long-term toxicity, i.e. potential for serotonergic neuronal brain damage of MDMA, um, should not be of concern in terminally ill patients begs the definition of terminal illness. Personally, we are impressed how often medical predictions about the immediacy of death prove wrong. <laughs> in any case, the protections of law apply to all citizens. Your belief that MDMA offers an advantage to the dying is an insufficient basis to remove that protection. Now, Paul Lieber, fortunately for all of us, was removed from his role as reviewing psychedelic research uh, a year after this. And so since 1990, we've basically had an open door at the FDA for scientific research with psychedelics. 
Um, it, it may surprise some of you to, to realize that it's a whole lot easier to do research with LSD than it is with marijuana. And the, the reason is there's a government monopoly on the supply of marijuana held by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And the reason that California was the pioneer in 1996 with Arizona to medical marijuana by initiative was because there was no way through the FDA. So our overall um, work with psychedelics has um, really shown that there is a pathway through this. The work that we're doing on marijuana is slowly, but not quite yet, eroding the prohibitions and the obstructions on medical marijuana research to make it into a medicine. But currently, we are now um, about six months away from finishing an international series of phase two pilot studies for um, people with PTSD, all different kinds. We'll have about 90 subjects. It will have cost us around $4 million to do all of this research, which has all been through donations. And the Hefter Research Institute is gonna be f uh, finishing up studies with psilocybin for end of life. Um, I just found out that um, the 90th anniversary of the New Yorker uh, magazine is gonna be in February. They're gonna have an article on psilocybin for end of life and all that research. So the culture is opening up in tremendous ways. We're gonna negotiate over the summer, starting with FDA, about the phase three studies, and we anticipate by 2021, as Virginia said, that we should be able to have MDMA um, approved as a prescription medicine with the support and the, that we need and I believe we will receive. Um, so that the idea for me is anchoring in our culture a openness to the experiences of psychedelics and non-ordinary consciousness and this, not just the unit of consciousness, but also all the opportunities for psychotherapy that these different psychedelics uh, provide us. And that hopefully we can build a more spiritual based culture that we feel it being born all around us. And that if we can do that, I think that will be the antidote to fundamentalism and the way in which we as a, a human, as a species, uh, living with other species on the earth, the way that we can all move forward together. I think in this kind of grounded mystical sense that was in many ways pioneered by uh, Leary and Ramdas and also Ken Kesey and Jerry Garcia and that whole other stream of um, the equally valid, I would say, transcendent, communal, uh, celebratory experiences. So that's why I think we do need to go beyond just the medical to the whole cultural openness. And, and I think the potential is there. And for me, I believe that psychedelics have been instrumental. And I think for many of us, um, they will have been and, and will be. So I, I think that the um, the movie that, that you're um, going to get distributed, it, it's, it's one of the, I think, more important ways to help people see what Leary was really trying to do and what Ramnus was trying to do and to really prepare our culture for this um, psychedelization of uh, options. And, and I think that um, it's so wonderful to see how, um, as you're saying, people that haven't come from the psychedelic tradition have seen this movie and have seen how important it is for them to share with family members and others that are dying. So I, I think together we really can um, achieve this uh, survival of the species. And I think that um, we've got a, you know, a, a great amount to work to do and a lot to celebrate. And, and a big part of this, I think, will be um, helping more and more people to see your movie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yes, you can. Since I have a microphone. Yeah. Um, you know, bringing back these medicines that many of our cultures have used for centuries, yeah. um, I just watched a documentary on CNN, this Deadly Highs, because by criminalizing these things, where kids are going for it anyway, this is the rites of passage. It's it's what you know they're seeking. What's under what they're seeking is the fact we keep, we're not good at giving them rites of passage either. But now, you know, all these chemicals that are being produced that are just one or two molecules off what they're really going for. But these are really deadly and dangerous. And these synthetic drugs manufactured in China are killing our children. I mean, they're overdosing. So the, if you could speak to that, the criminalization 
of these things that are naturally sought after. We want to alter consciousness. We want these tools. And um, how much is that part of the conversation that we are um, now promoting, really, to stay ahead of the legal game, these much deadlier chemicals? And how, how much do people know about that? Well, what we have, sadly, um, in our drug policy, it's a harm maximization policy. The idea is how can we make it the worst for the people that use these drugs so that um, William Bennett, who was the one of the uh, more prominent drug czars, um, he talked about um, the real heart of the drug problem was the non-problem user. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the people that use drugs without problems, because they were like the typhoid Mary, they, they would get other people to think that they could also use these drugs and then they would have problems. So we really had to go after the marijuana user and the people that actually even benefited from these drugs, that they were the heart of the problem. And so the one factor that are, has been underlying prohibition for the last 40 years has been these surveys of um, what is um, drug use patterns and what they found the one reliable correlation is an inverse relationship between perceived risk and drug abuse now keep in mind all drug use that's all illegal drug use is defined as abuse but what that means is as perceived risk goes up drug use goes down and as the perception of risk goes down drug use will go up and so there's been this conscious effort to maximize the harms and so one of the things that could be easily done with all these synthetic chemicals not all of them are dangerous but it would be people don't know what they're getting and some of them are dangerous. So we could have drug testing. We could have legal drugs um, where they're tested. And we know what, so the idea of providing honest drug education with product uh, integrity and information. So the, the rise of these synthetic drugs is in a way part of this effort to, to um, sow fear. So now kids don't know what they're getting. So that I think we, we need to shift from this um, harm maximization to a harm reduction approach but there, there's something a little bit limited about the harm reduction approach is that people get stuck um, talking about it and reducing harms and you don't get this idea of the benefits as well. So I think that's where the kids are really are looking for something. I remember I was at that age. And so I think the, um, the approach is not to say some of these synthetics are dangerous, we have to criminalize them. It just seems to me that the more dangerous the drug is, the more important it is that it be legal because we want people, if they have problems, like with the opiates, to not be stigmatized and come get help as soon as they can. So I think that the work that we're trying to do with psychedelics will show people that changing consciousness isn't always hallucinations, delusions, and distractions, and that it's something that it is healthy and has been done for thousands of years, and I think that the same we're seeing with medical marijuana. The more people are seeing that there are benefits, and so we're, we're at this really important kind of inflection point in our culture about really undoing prohibition. And those of us that are looking to um, end that, we need to start thinking, what does a post-prohibition world look like? And that's where the models of the therapeutic use of these drugs, the recreational use of these drugs with harm reduction pro um, programs in mind, I think that in a way it's incumbent on all of us to be the change that we want to see, to try to show how a post-prohibition world can actually operate. And not all the problems are just going to go away, but that uh, I think that the, the psychedelic research and the medical marijuana research making these things into medicines is going to be a key of this building a post-prohibition world. Uh, in my point, from my point of view, the greatest addiction we all suffer with is called money. And if you really look at the structure of our society, it's always about money. And if you want to change this society, I have a website called Profound Democracy. I just went to a conference that Rabbi Michael Werner had, and what we're trying to do is find a way to get an amendment, it sounds hopeless, that takes money out of politics. Oh, yeah. Because if yeah. you don't get money out of politics, you don't get rid of prohibition. 
And prohibition is what sparks people making money. Anybody who watches Boardwalk Empire, a fascinating style study uh, about prohibition and alcoholism, alcoholism, prohibition, they came together as money. So North Korea, China, India, and our country all sell some bad products. And what's the motivation? It's not about thinking about who's getting it, who the end user is. You look at opium production in Afghanistan, the statistics are staggering since the U.S. invasion. It's all about money. It's not about opium. It's not about who's using it. It's not about kids getting hurt. It's how do I make a buck and what niche can I find? Money out of politics. Yeah. I second that emotion. So Ben Cohen has a great campaign, Stamp Stamp or Stampede, Stamp Stampede stampede.org and he um, you can get a stamp stamp your money great replication of, uh, a lot of messaging yeah a lot of organizations yeah I think Virginia would you like to open it up for questions um, yeah. so we want to take questions from the audience and we don't have a microphone on the floor so if you but at the um, I was told that this is a very live um, space and if you stand up and speak clearly that we will be able to hear it and then the person who um, the question is directed to will repeat your question and then answer it and um, do feel I mean, we don't want to hold you all here I know it's late but if and also if you'd like to move up you're welcome to do that because there's some um, seats up in front. So let's get going with the question and answer. And let me remind you to make sure you pick up your book at the at the table before you leave. <laughs> yeah, and I want to thank you all for coming and for being here. And so, just a question. Just raise your hand. Uh, could you stand, stand up? Sam. You can stand up yes. and just state the question. Uh, so it seems that, you know, many of us um, so, I guess my question is, uh, going back to the movie, what is Timothy Leary's and Ram Dass' experience with uh, dimethyltryptamine? Well, I have the question, but not the answer. Um, the, que the question was, um, what kind of experiences have uh, Tim and Ramdas had with DMT? Well, I mean, just, you know, is is that your question? Yes, it is. But just because it's, you know, it seems that you know this movie, what it's, uh, you know, really um, alluding to is is this, at least for me, this mystery of death. And especially considering Timothy Leary and uh, Ram Dass have been such a promote, proponent of radical thinking, especially regarding you know, consciousness and death, um, I would think that they may or may not have experienced with dimethyltryptamine. So I'm wondering um, if maybe you have thought about putting that into the documentary because as far as I know that's like the most powerful psychedelic in the entire world um, and if it is even considered a psychedelic um, and I'm also wondering if you have any trials going around or any ideas as to uh, just because I personally am very curious as to um, okay well I'll um, <laughs> um, say that the, the, the DMT I would say 5-methoxy DMT is more powerful than DMT um, and different kinds of drugs have different kind of powers, but that the ego dissolution that um, happens with DMT or, or 5-methoxy, that it's something that is so rapid and it's so divorced for, or so separate from our normal consciousness that they, those drugs tend to be more inspirational rather than therapeutic. And so there are no studies looking at therapeutic uses right now of DMT or 5-methoxy, but in the form of ayahuasca, where it's orally administered and it lasts several hours longer, um, mostly used in religious contexts, but there's a growing world uh, international scientific investigation of therapeutic use of ayahuasca. 
and it's through ayahuasca and the treatment of addiction and the treatment of uh, depression. There's just a lot going on, but I think for us, at least, you know, through limited resources, we're trying to focus on the drugs that we think can most likely make it through the system and be accepted by the culture and be accepted by therapists and psychiatrists. So I think it'll be a long time before we have DMT made into a medicine. And I think that the um, personal use by um, uh, Tim and, and Ramdas, I, I don't know much about their use of DMT. <laughs> I, I took I took DMT with Tim Leary uh, at one point, and uh, he was infuriated when we finally came back to uh, you know <laughs> where we were sort of human uh, because he said the only other person I've ever met that wanted to try to talk on that stuff with Alan Watts was Alan Watts, and I didn't like it when he did it either. <laughs> uh, and it, it is. And I, we, we, had, we then had an argument about whether or not the place that we had gone was a spiritual place. So, uh, and that's something that, you know, you see ongoing in the movie and I think it's, uh, it is interesting. Uh, this, it, that question was resolved toward the end and I wish that, I wish that could be covered in the movie eventually. There is an article in your MAPS <clears throat> journal somewhere called Timothy's Bon Voyage about his last DMT trip, which I administered. And there were about um, 12 of us in the room, in his bedroom. So you can Google that, Timothy's Bon Voyage, and we'll answer some of that for you. <clears throat> Ramdas wasn't there, but they took DMT quite a lot. If you read in the... Um, old issues of the psychedelic review, they talk about it. They talk about the experiential typewriter, trying to, well, with Alan Watts, did you just say that, where they tried to type while they were tripping on DMT <laughs> with a typewriter that didn't have letters, it had um, symbols of uh, religious tradition, so they were trying to make a, oh, I saw that, I saw that. <laughs> that was Bob Forte. Brilliant book, too, on Tim. Um, having, exp uh, first of all, does anybody know why, uh, what, it was 1969, I was in the Mo Des Moines, Iowa, and Timothy was there, and it's not in the movie, and he was, just, he was basically claiming he was running for president, and why wasn't that in the movie? I, just because there, there was just too much. But he was distributing this, Fabulous acid, and, <laughs> and and that was and that leads to my question, which is the the quality of acid back then, and <laughs> and um, and that that's not available. I understand Sandoz uh, lost that patent. The patent's gone. The drug doesn't exist anymore. If that wasn't available then it would cl clearly seem to me that you don't have acid anymore because that was acid. And then, I'm just going to say that. And well. then, and wait, wait, that's just, that, that, I don't, you don't have to deal with that. I'm just, and, but my question is, is that um, would they have taken, uh, well, Timothy Leary, would he have considered taking acid in, in, into his last minutes? And apparently he took TMT. Well, I mean, we have the example of um, Aldous Huxley, who died in 63 under the influence of LSD given to him by Laura, who was in some of the uh, pictures in the movie. Um, so I think that letting go of ego death that happens when we take LSD for uh, personal growth, therapeutic, spiritual experiences, that that can be helpful in end of life situation as well. Um, but I think that um, there is really good LSD around now. <laughs> and, you know, the stuff that was around in the 60s, I think the big thing is that it was higher potency. And a lot of the LSD that's around now is lower potency. And you just, uh, in a way, it's part of the self-regulatory system so that people have to intentionally take um, numerous to have th those kind of profound experiences. So it's kind of a safety measure that the LSD is lower potency per bladder acid. But I think the... Um, the main question I think you're saying is, what about the use of psychedelics in the hospice setting? So our research is all 
for people who have um, at least nine months to live. You know, we need to have people in a study for several months, then we want to follow them for several months afterwards. For those people that get the placebo, we want them to have an opportunity to get the full dose afterwards. So um, our research is really not quite at the end of life, but I think that uh, I've worked with people within days of their lives with MDMA and other, other drugs. So I think the use of psychedelics in a hospice setting um, is one of the best uses for it, but it will take us a while to get there in terms of legal medical use. Um, how do you feel about current legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco versus illegal drugs like DMT, MDMA? How old are you, by the way? Yeah. Thirteen. <laughs> 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 well, I, I think actually it's, it's, it's a great question, and I'll just be say that, that we saw that when Tim went in the movie, when he was testifying before Congress, um, he was talking about there should be kind of a license for using psychedelics. So I, I currently think, I think that of course tobacco and alcohol should be legal. But I, I look at, um, for example, drunk driving. A lot of times people, um, if they are arrested for drunk driving multiple times, um, they lose their license to drive, but they can still buy alcohol. And a lot of people, uh, drunk drivers, kill people after they've lost their license. So I think that we should tighten up a little bit the regulation of tobacco and alcohol so that you have automatic license, but if you misbehave using those drugs, then you lose your ability to buy them for a certain period of time. And I think that the, um, the drugs that um, we're talking about are more consciousness expansion, but I think that people should have the options to explore that. And both tobacco and alcohol have been used in sacred contexts by other cultures. And I think we. And yeah, wine, for sure, and our culture too. So that I think we've lost, in a sense, the sacred relationship to those drugs and have, you know, many people then use them too frequently. And so I think approaching these drugs as um, with care, with caution, you know, not using them all the time, I think that's what really builds more value from the experiences. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a shrink. I work as a psychiatrist. I see uh, a lot of people who have terrible problems with alcohol, uh, kids who've watched parents fight violence, uh, alcohol in excess causes terrible problems. More motor vehicle accidents, people suicide under it. So uh, alcohol is not a benign substance, yet it's legal and it should be legal. The issue is how to help people control their appetite for it. Uh, cigarettes I don't have a good feeling for. In almost any way, I used to smoke two packs a day. It wasn't really very good for me. I don't think it's good for people, but it should be legal. So, you know, people suffer with these drugs and we have still tremendous rates of illness and death from uh, cigarette use. So, don't smoke. <laughs>